So let's introduce Steph. It's going to be a first talk, so let's give her a, a chance to uh, uh, get the stuff out, and also uh, Ollie and a few of the other guys will help out as well on the course. So uh, let's welcome Steph. Thank you. Um, thank you, everybody, um, for venturing out in the rain to join me uh, to share this talk with all of you. Um, I'd really like to change um, the, the the structure of this talk and, and invite it to be more of like an open dialogue and a debate because essentially the plight of the bee is a topic that concerns all of us um, and it's something that's very dear to my heart um, and I've had multiple experiences that have really deepened my connection with bees but essentially bees matter to all of us and so if anyone has anything to add to the discussion um, really be welcomed and it also helps to build the energy as well so if anyone has any questions or comments, um, they'll be really greatly received. Um, so, we'd like to st well, I'd like to start the talk um, with a video. It's a short time lapse, um, basically showing the life cycle of the bee, so that we can kind of attune ourselves with the bee and her life cycle as she moves about in the world. Um, Here is a bee egg as it hatches into a larva. Those newly hatched larvae swim around their cells, feeding on the liquid food that nurse bees secrete for them. Then their head and their legs start to differentiate as they transform into pupae. Here's that same pupation process seen from above with varroa mites running around in the cells. Next, the tissue reorganizes in their body and the pigment slowly develops in their eyes. In the last step, their skin shrivels up and they sprout hair. Yeah. <laughs> I really like that video because it really shows um, the, the productivity of bees. At this oh, time, the oh, that's the video. is worldwide. We are losing honeybees. It's a really good video, world. and we'll play it a little bit later. He's one of my favorite speakers on beekeeping, sustainable beekeeping. His name's Gunther. He's a really interesting guy. Um, the cool thing about that video is you get to see as soon as the bees submerge from the cell, immediately they turn around and start cleaning out their own cell. They're all always um, focused on, on expansion and cleaning and productivity, so that's why I like that video. Um, so yeah, I would like to thank you all again for coming out in the rain um, to come and listen to this talk. Um, bees generally don't come out in the rain. Um, in the rain, they're gen generally at home, uh, all tucked up together, all in a tight ball, uh, vibrating and keeping warm. But every other day, when it's not raining, when the sun is shining, the bees are out there working tirelessly, eight hours a day, um, foraging, uh, finding their food, but in essence, um, working to sustain the lives of all of us on Earth here. Um, and so we've got a lot to be grateful for, for the bees. And so I'm really glad that there's so many people that are receptive to this talk because there's so many solutions um, at hand for us to help kind of regain our partnership with bees. Um, yeah, so it, this talk is mainly about bee guardianship rather than beekeeping essentially. And it's about a revival of respect and reverence for these bees and how we can enter into unity with them once more. Um, so yeah. I think so. Um, so yeah, I'll start um, by kind of introducing myself and explaining how I became submerged into the world of the bee. Um, and it was through this man, uh, Jerry Freeman. Um, at the time, I was living in Kalka, which is a place in the Sacred Valley of the Inca, um, working on a seed preservation farm. Um, and once I arrived there, um, I noticed these really peculiar shaped hives on the land. Um, they were like upside down Toblerones. I'd never seen anything like it before, but I noticed the hum of activity going on inside the hive. And I was blown away and really excited to learn about bees. And so finally, one day, the bee man turned up and I just ran straight over to him and I was like, I want to know about bees, tell me about bees. And he's like, what do you know about bees? Uh, and I was like, well, nothing really, but I want to. Um, and so with that, he decided to put together an apprenticeship program um, of which myself, Ollie and Andrea were all part of. Um, so he's, in essence, he's the reason why we entered this sacred world of the bee. 
And this was a, actually a picture from our first contact with the bees. And if you see in this picture, his steady sense of calm and peace as he handles the bees. And you'll notice he's wearing no uniform and no veil and no gloves. Um, it was a lovely sunny day. Um, and he, as he lifted the comb from the hive, the bees were just humming and vibrating really gently. You know, and that shows, it shows that they're really calm and peaceful in his presence. Um, and then shortly after this picture was taken, he turned to me, um, and I'd been working on the farm all day, I was wearing like a vest, you know, like no protection. And he just said, hey, um, hold this for a second. And I was like, okay, you know, like no doubt in my mind that that wasn't 100% safe. Absolutely no fear. And that's because of the presence Jerry had with the bees. And he passed that on to me and to Andrea and to Ollie and everybody else that was present for the course. Um, we learned a hell of a lot from Jerry. Um, and sadly, he passed away last year. So I really just want to send out my gratitude and love for this man that essentially changed my life. Um, so yeah, he'll live on um, through these teachings. Um, so I'd like to start um, talking about the superorganism that is the hive of the bee. So when we think of bees, we can't just think of one bee alone. Essentially, the bees are a superorganism, all interlinked, working together in complete unity to create abundance within the hive. Um, the hive is comprised of the foragers, the queen, and the drones. Um, the foragers are the female bees that maintain and expand the hive. They actually do everything in the hive. The, well, not everything, but mostly everything, from building comb uh, to foraging for food, feeding the brood, which is the baby bees. Um, they also protect the hive from threat. They feed the queen. They do everything. They do cleaning. They actually serve as the respiratory function of the hive as well. So if the hive gets really, really hot, they'll actually all gather together at the doorway and just vibrate their wings and circulate air amongst the hive. They also work as the digestive tract as well, circulating food amongst the hive and uh, dispersing it where it's needed. They're amazing. When, when you're with the hive, you can really see this unity of this whole body um, and how they all work so, so fluidly, just as our own body works, you know? It's quite amazing to behold. A lot of people tend to think that the queen is the one that's in control of the hive. It's in the name, you know, it's, we ascribe this name, queen, you know, as some kind of ruler. But that's really not the case. Um, it's actually the foragers that make all of the decisions regarding uh, where the queen lays the eggs. The queen is so important to the hive, but she's not in control. Um, it's the whole entity. Um, so basically the queen is there to basically lay the eggs um, and in times of really high nectar flow she'll actually lay up to like 1,000 eggs a day like she is a machine you know she's fantastic and because she's so vital all of the other bees work together to protect her and feed her and nurture her because she's such a vital role um, actually without the queen um, if you're with a hive that's queenless it's a really hopeless state of affairs. I've actually been with a hive um, that was queenless. They lost a queen. And um, you could hear it in the buzz, in the hum. It was a really hopeless state, you know? It was like a song of mourning, you know? Because without the queen, they'll all perish. They need the queen to constantly regenerate the cycle of bees. So she's so key and so important. And when you, when you see the queen in the hive, it's, it's a complete blessing. She's a beautiful, beautiful creature. She's larger than the other, than the other bees, um, and in many cases, she's completely golden. She's really, really beautiful. Um, there's something else about the queen. Yeah, the interesting thing about queens and foragers as well is they're all the same um, in the first moments of their lives. They're all born of the same egg, which is a fertilized egg. The, the sole difference between a queen and a forager is diet alone. So the queen is fed exclusively on a diet of royal jelly, Whereas the rest of the foragers, they're fed on a diet of pollen and honey after the first three days. And the amazing thing is the queen can live up to 12 years. There's documents that documented um, occurrences of queens living to be 12 years old. Whereas a forager lives up to six weeks. So you can imagine what a special, amazing, life-giving substance this royal jelly is. Um, there are some people that harvest royal jelly, um, and we'll get onto that a little bit later. Um, but in a place like a bee sanctuary, where bee welfare is respected, um, generally wouldn't harvest royal jelly because of the detrimental effects on the hive. But we'll go into that a bit later. Um, the drones, they're the larger male bee at the bottom, and you'll notice that they have really big eyes, because the main task of the drone is to spot queens and mate with them. So 
The drones basically, they leave the hive in the morning while all the females are busy working and foraging and doing all the maintenance. And they fly out to what's called like the drone congregation area or the drone bar, people say, you know. And they all just hang out there and they look for queens and hope that they're going to get lucky that day. That's their sole task, is to spread the genetics out into the world, you know. Because bees are always in a state of expansion. So when they reach that point of expansion and they want to spread the genetics out, that's time for the drones to do their job. But sadly, um, the whole life cycle of the drone is gearing up to this moment. But sadly, when that moment happens, if the drone is lucky enough, um, he finally mates with the queen and it's an amazing climactical situation. And then shortly afterwards, the queen rips the, the phallus out of the male and he perishes and dies. And then the queen keeps, squeezes the last bit out and keeps it. <laughs> yeah, he's a donor. Um, about the drones, an uh, interesting thing about the drone is because the, the drone is a result of an unfertilized egg, yeah. um, it means the drone has a mother, it hasn't got a father. Yeah. But it does have a grandmother and a grandfather because the egg came from the queen and the queen was fertilized egg. Ah. So therefore the queen had a mother and a father, which means that, you know, so there's the drone, some the drone has a grandfather and a grandmother, but no, no father. father. That's really interesting. And also, when they, they um, mate with the queen, the queen flies up and, and she, tr she flies higher, and then the drone tries to catch her up. Mm -hmm. And she flies higher still, and the highest drone, the, the drone that can fly, the, the highest, highest uh, that's the one she mates with. The fittest. That yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Have you ever seen it happen? I've, I've seen some at uh, a uh, uh, place where drones congregate. Oh, cool. Yeah. I've never seen honeybees mate, but the other day I saw um, a new queen um, that was gearing down to rest. I think it was like a leaf cutter or something. Uh, I saw her mating with a drone in midair. I was like, whoa. <laughs> yeah, it was cool. Um, okay, I think it's the next slide. Yeah. <clears throat> so briefly, um, no, not briefly, sorry, this is pollination. So, yeah, basically bees pollinate and that's probably the greatest gift that they can give mankind and all the rest of creation. Um, and I see this act of pollination as unifying the heavens and earth. Um, it's, the ancient Egyptians said that bees were born from the tears of Ra, um, the sun god, and bees are solar beings. They are ruled by the sun um, and they, it's the vital source energy of the sun that gives them strength and gives them power. It's because of the sun that they can navigate themselves in relation to the hive. Um, and it's through this solar energy that enables them to go out into the world and perform this sacred dance, like dancing from flower to flower, bringing together the heavens, the sun, and the earth in the flowers. And through this sacred dance, they essentially create sustenance and uh, abundance for all of creation. So yeah, that's how I like to see it in my mind's eye when I see bees dancing, you know, it's the unification of both worlds. So yeah, um, a lot of people are aware of how important bees are uh, for this act of pollination. So I just thought I'd put up a little bit of an image so that we can kind of see what the world would look like if we didn't have our precious bees. Um, as you can see, the supermarket shelves are pretty empty. Um, and here's a nice thing at the bottom. It says, we can thank the bees for one bite of food in every three bites that we take. So one third of all food that we eat comes from the pollination of bees. And so you can imagine without this cosmic dance of heaven and earth, uh, we'd have very little to eat. And so we really do have so much to be grateful for. And I think we might have fallen out of this, uh, this acknowledgement of this sacred partnership. And I think now is the time that we kind of step back into it and realize what we can do for the bees. Um, so I'd like to talk a little bit about the bee products. Um, just because... Um, they create such wonderful things as well as pollination. Um, everything they create is beautiful um, and really medicinal and yeah, just fantastic. Um, Jerry, the man that you saw earlier, um, he used to have a phrase. He used to say, "Eating pollen is the closest thing that you can eat uh, that you can get to eating light." That com combined uh, with the raw sexual energy of plants, which is essentially life force. Um, it's really, really good for you. It's super high in protein, uh, vitamins, amino acids, calcium, potassium, iron, zinc, magnesium, and folic acid. It's a complete superfood. It's really, really good for you. Um, yeah, I can't speak highly enough of pollen. Obviously, the removal of hive products must always be done in, um, in, sacred, in, in respect and reverence 
after the gifts that the bees are giving us. And we just never ever take more than the bees can afford to give. And so I really believe in my heart that if we spend time with bees and develop this union of respect, um, I really believe that they're happy to share in this goodness, um, as they're happy to share in this goodness of pollination, as long as it's done in this uh, respect and the value of the work that they do. Um, so I just thought I'd put a little statistic on that, um, because people take pollen in the morning, I do. I like to do it as part of my morning sacrament um, and kind of meditate on all the work that goes into this. Um, so one teaspoon of pollen takes one bee one month to gather, working eight hours a day t to produce this pollen. So one whole month, constantly foraging, eight hours a day, visiting up to like two million plants or something. Like, yeah, that was it. I think it was two million plants that go into one grain of pollen. So it's like huge amounts of labor. Um, and so the bees need this protein. It's really, really good for them, just as it's good for us. So we have to ask that question, are we justified in taking it? And I really feel in my heart that we can be justified as long as it's done in true partnership and respect of the value of that product. Just ask, uh, how, how would you tell what's a respectful amount? So harvesting um, pollen, you can only, the best time to do that is at the beginning of spring when all the flowers are blossoming. So there's an abundance of food for the bees. Um, any later than that, it probably wouldn't be justified because you need to ensure that they have enough pollen for the rest of the season. All throughout the summer there's abundance. And so spring's a really good time. For me, I'd probably put on a, a pollen trap onto the hive for maybe a couple of hours on a really sunny day and then just take that, you know, and then see how the bees fare after that and just constantly maintain that progress. Um, and if I noticed, if, if perhaps I took too much, I would replace that pollen as well. So just kind of tracking the progress. How would you tell? How can you tell? Um well, you judge by the amount of pollen that the bees are bringing in. Um, so uh, through your inspections, you'd notice every day the amounts of pollen going up. So you can judge how strong the hive is um, and how well they can maintain themselves and basically bring food in. So you can judge how long to leave the trap on and how little to take, you know. That's how I do it. Um, <laughs> yeah, you just ask him. <laughs> yeah, I give them an interchange. I plant loads of flowers so they've got plenty of food. You know, that's, that's one of the first things you do before you get bees. You create abundant habitat so they've got plenty. Um, another gift from the bees is honey. And so throughout mankind, man has had a sacred partnership with bees, um, right through like Samaria, e Egypt, India, Mayan culture had a really sacred uh, partnership with the bees. Um, because of, well, maybe not just because of honey, but um, a lot of them harvested honey and made mead and yeah, it was a really valuable resource for them back then. Um, so yeah, honey is made from the flowering nectar of plants, alchemically transformed by the bees. Um, the bees are the great alchemists. Uh, they transform things in many, many ways. The nectar transforms into this golden, rich substance. They're also great alchemists in terms of the wax, which we'll go on to in a, in a few minutes. Um, I'm sure many people have heard that honey can keep forever without spoiling, which kind of alludes to this idea of immortality. You know, it's something really, really sacred um, and really, really special. There's that story of the ancient Egyptian tombs, you know, finding honey and these, it's still good. It's not stopping them putting a sell-by date on it, is it? Yeah, <laughs> no, probably don't need to do that. Um, so yeah, in ancient Egypt, honey was deeply valued and beekeepers were respected as priests because essentially they were seen as kind of bridging the gap, you know, to the gods. The bees were the sacred messengers of the gods and the maintainers of life. And so, yeah, beekeepers were held in really high regard because um, they regularly commune with the gods. Um, honey was used as food and medicine, also for mummification, um, which kind of, again, kind of alludes to this idea of immortality, kind of like uh, progressing the, the pharaohs into the next life. Um, it was also used for offerings for the fertility god, which makes sense. Because um, talking about the, um, the honey that, uh, you know, been stored for years and years and years, like in the pyramids, I heard the story of uh, archaeologists looking at the pyramids and they found a clay pot in there that was full of honey. Mm -hmm. So I took the lid off and looked at it and said, it looks all right. And, yeah, it tastes all right. And the 
two or three of them doing that. Yeah. Then later on, they found out there was uh, <laughs> the remains of a mummy fun baby. Oh. I heard that. Oh. <laughs> I heard that as they took a bite, um, a hair came out in right. somebody's mouth and they're like, oh, what is that? Yeah. So they dug deeper and it was a baby. Oh. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so ancient Greece as well and um, this is something I'd really like to look into it's something that's kind of coming to my consciousness more and more it's to do with the Melissa which is this sacred group of like bee priestesses um, that worked in sacred partnership with the bee and that's something that I'm kind of delving into more these days um, but in ancient Greece, um, honey was one of the main ingredients of ambrosia, which was the food of the gods. And so again, it's, if honey is appropriate for the gods, you know, it's something that, that feeds the immortal, then it can be good for us too. Um, in Buddhist tradition as well, um, honey is an integral part in one of the religious festivals, which celebrates the retreat of the Buddha into the wilderness. And in this, in this moment, uh, there's a story of a monkey bringing the Buddha um, a honeycomb so that he can feed himself and sustain himself. Um, which again, kind of points to the purity of this substance. Um, you know, because the Buddha was going for enlightenment and he needs light stuff. Um, in Celtic mythology as well, this is something that I just read the other day. Um, bees were regarded as beings of great wisdom. They were actually the messengers of the gods. And so this started this whole thing in folklore about telling the bees everything. So the bees would be part of your family. Um, and so you would go to the bees and tell them everything that's going on in your life because they would then take the messages to the gods. Um, especially if there was a tragedy or a death. Um, apparently you're supposed to go to the bees and explain that. Um, and invite them to the funeral as well. Like I heard a story, it was printed in a newspaper in the States of a, a beekeeper that worked with bees his whole life. And, um, and when he died, the bees actually came to his funeral and landed on his coffin to send him into the next life. It was a really old report. It was pretty cool. So yeah, again, I'm just, um, you know, Egypt and Samaria and ancient Greece uh, and Maya and India, they all had this sacred, reverent respect for the bees. Um, something that I really believe that we've lost touch of, uh, lost touch with these days. And I think it's time now to kind of reclaim that sacred partnership. Um, and kind of recognize the bees for who they are and what they're doing for us uh, so that we can best give our love back to them. Just, just add on, on, on Colombia, there's in Colombia that the, some of the indigenous tribes there used to use the wax to make molds to make these beautiful gold kind of um, like depictions of the deities. They did. And they used these loads of different types of honey uh, honeybee wax that they used to collect. Yeah, they things. were really, really clever. They used to breed specific types of bees um, that, uh, that had uh, properties in the wax that were really good they could sustain really high temperatures so they could um, hold the gold in like a, a mold they were really clever they experimented a lot with that process I think yeah it's interesting yeah it is interesting um, so yeah yeah I think there's some um, so yeah, about the properties of honey, why was everybody so interested in honey and what makes it so wonderful? Um, it's because it's a fantastic medicine used internally and externally. It's a fantastic antibiotic, uh, fantastic anti-inflammatory, antifungal. Um, it's full of vitamins and minerals and amino acids and it can cure us of many, many, many different ails. Um, it's good for coughs uh, and memory and allergies and a whole plethora of other ailments. Um, but there is, again, a huge amount of labor involved in the honey production. So bees gather from, yeah, it was two million plants to make one pound of honey. That was it, not the, not the pollen. I think it was pollen. Um, so a bee, in order to, to gather the nectar to make one pound of honey, that bee has to fly up to 90,000 miles which would be three times around the world to make one pound of honey. So, yeah, I mean, to sit with that, you know, and taking a teaspoon of honey in the morning, you know, like what a gift that is and how much labor has gone into that teaspoon, you know, it almost makes me feel a bit guilty when I'm throwing away the spoon and there's still traces of honey on there, you know, just, yeah. It's nice to meditate with that as you use it and use it as a medicine rather than an abundant food source, you know. Um, so yeah, I think we need to kind of give thanks and give, give praise and appreciation to the bees for this beautiful, beautiful gift. Another product uh, that the bees can, can provide us with or, or that use for themselves um, in the hive is propolis. 
Um, it's the unsung uh, medicine um, of the bee world. Uh, it's a fantastic substance. Um, it's actually made from the, the resinous secretions of certain trees. Um, and the bees gather this resin and take it back to the hive and then mix it with their own kind of alchemical process. Um, and it's what keeps the hive pure. And so they'll seal off the hive um, so that uh, the hive is free of infection. And if there's an intruder into the hive, like a mouse or something, the bees will, will, will sting the mouse uh, so he dies, and then they'll engulf him in kind of like a casing of propolis so that infections aren't spread that way. It's like a really amazing substance. Um, it contains all of the known vitamins except vitamin K, but pollen has that, so you know they do provide many things. Um, it's got 500 or more bioflavonoids, um, more flav yeah, than oranges. Uh, it's got f it's 50 to 70 percent resin, 30 to 50 percent wax, and 5 to 10 percent pollen, and then it's got essential oils in there too, which I just learned today. Interesting. Um, so this is the wax making pro uh, process. Um, <coughs> wax is amazing. It's so so amazing. It actually. It's nice to consider how wax is made. Um, wax is actually made through this process of bees feeding on honey. Um, the bees, in order to make a pound of wax, they have to eat approximately six pounds of honey, which they then alchemically transform in this internal magic that they have. And the wax is actually secreted out of their stomachs. It actually is literally comes from their very being. Um, it's amazing how that happens. Um, and just maybe off point, but... Um, in the modern beekeeping world, in the industrial world, more and more beekeepers are choosing to keep bees on plastic comb, um, which I think is an absolute abomination. Um, I mean, you wouldn't want a woman to live with a plastic womb, um, and I don't think bees should have to live in a plastic womb either. Um, and it's literally part of their very being and essence, and so I think it's really good to allow bees to um, go through that process of producing wax and to live on that wax, because it's part of them. And I really like making candles out of this wax. Uh, when I was living in the Sacred Valley, I started uh, dipping candles in the old traditional method. Um, and as I did that, I like to meditate on the process um, of that wax and how it came into being. And so, as we were speaking about earlier, it's the sacred partnership of heaven and earth. And so, the solar energy comes down from the heavens and illuminates the earth and creates this perfect habitat for plants to grow. Um, the plants then grow and then secrete this pollen and nectar which the bees then gather and transform into honey. And then from that honey, the bees then transform that into wax uh, through alchemy and it comes out of their being. Then from that wax, the beekeeper can turn it into a candle, you know, which provides heat and warmth and light, which essentially returns it back to the, to the sun, you know, the solar energy. So I like it, it's kind of like full cycle doing it that way. So <clears throat> what happened to the bees? You know, it's, it's a very current topic these days and everybody realizes that the bees are in trouble. But one thing that I really noticed is, you know, there's still a lot of mystery around that topic for many, many people. Um, and so, yeah, I'd like to basically share a few um, of my understandings as to why this problem has transpired. Um, and the main thing really, I think it's because of the human desire for dominance over the earth um, and it's rain destruction on this planet. It's human beings seeing the earth in terms of resources rather than valuing the many, many gifts uh, from our mother earth. Um, and we're destroying habitats. Basically, bees have no home anymore. They, they need somewhere to live and they need some food. Um, so as you can see here, this is a massive monocrop. Um, at one time of the year when the nectar flow is strong, uh, there's abundance of food right there. There's loads and loads of food, but the problem is it's only for one very, very short time in the year. The whole, like the rest of the year, it's an absolute desert. There's nowhere for the bees to live and they would starve to death if they lived in that area. That's why people transport bees there for pollination and then they transport the bees out of there because no native indigenous bees, bumblebees, wild bees can live there so they bring in the honeybees to do that job. Um, so yeah, monoculture is a big destroyer of our bees. Um, this is an image of the almond groves in California which is a massive monocrop. Um, I just got these statistics today. I didn't realize actually how big it was. It's actually 600,000 acres 
um, in Bakersfield in California, it's in Southern California. Um, just imagine the size of that. They actually produce uh, more than 80% of the world's almonds come from this one place. So you can imagine how big that is. Um, so it takes over 22 days and it's a lot more than bees can handle. Um, each spring it takes 1.6 million honey beehives to pollinate this crop. And so this is the rise of migratory beekeeping. So they essentially, the people involved in this business in the industrial world, they ship the bees across the country, well not ship them, on, on huge trucks actually, they pack them up pack them in, like feed them full of, pump them full of pesticides and insecticides and all these different chemicals and ship them across the country to pollinate this crop. And when the bees are moved from place to place, they lose their field source, you know, which is everything, it's their navigation. And so they have to completely remap the area. And so you can imagine moving from one place to another, to another, to another. It's keeping them in a sus suspended state of confusion, you know. It's like, okay, where are we? Okay, here we are. Uh, let's find home, you know, let's find the food. Um, which can be quite detrimental. Um, yeah, it's, it's just not a nice operation. I actually watched a documentary, which I'll recommend at the end, um, and it explains how people involved in this world, they ship them into the almonds. Uh, the bees work tirelessly to pollinate this crop for us so that we can eat almonds. And then after that, all of the honey from most, from most of the beekeepers is then removed from the hive. And then they're fed, in many, many cases, high fructose corn syrup as a means of like, helping them survive, you know? Which I think is a real insult to the creators of this golden, beautiful nectar, um, just feeding them the waste product of society. It's like, it's really upsetting. Um, also, I mean, it works on many levels. Um, this is destroying the bees, but it's also destroying uh, habitats for the rest of us as well. It's degrading the soil, degrading the landscape. It's not healthy for the bees and it's not healthy for us. Um, and California is in a water crisis right now. Um, NASA actually did a study um, not so long ago, basically um, analyzing uh, the water resources of California. And in this study, they took into account all of the water from the rivers and the creeks and the lakes, um, caught in snow-capped peaks, mountains, in the clouds, every little bit of water. And they discovered that California only has one year's water left. And so unless dramatic changes happen to the, to the structure of the farming in California, they're about to enter into a crash. And so change is needed uh, and there are options. Uh, but yeah, we have to change our system. It's against nature. Okay. And 10% of that goes to this, isn't it? Yeah, and 10% of the water goes to this plantation, you know. 1.1 trillion gallons of water. Yeah, 1.1 trillion gallons of water. Yeah, yeah it's a lot. <laughs> Nestle, pinch it as well, the bottle of water. Yeah. Yeah, Nestle, yeah. yeah. Exactly. yeah. Um, um, well, a lot of it's in the sea, um, and we can't really drink that water. The usable water is actually much, much smaller. I saw, I was on Steve's permaculture course, um, and he showed us a really interesting image of the Earth, um, and the Earth was about this big. And then there was a smaller sphere within that earth, um, which was all of the water on earth, which is about that big. And then all of the usable water on the earth was only about this big. So even though it looks like this beautiful blue planet, um, there's only a thin layer of water that we can use and we really should value that resource and use it a lot more wisely, I think. Um, another thing that's causing this detrimental effect to our honeybees and, and all bees <laughs> is the chemical warfare that's being waged on nature uh, in the form of pesticides. Um, yeah, it's <clears throat> destroying the life of bees and many other, many other creatures on the earth, the bugs and the birds, um, yeah. Humans. Humans, yeah, <laughs> all of us really. Um, one of the big ones uh, that's really having a detrimental effect on the bees is the neonicotinoid pesticides. Um, so there's, there's a little quote here, it says five neonicotinoid dressed me uh, maize seeds or 32 dressed oilseed rape seeds are enough to kill a partridge. And so it's not very much actually to, to, to destroy habitats and to destroy life forms. Um, neonicotinoids impact on all species that chew a plant, sip its sap, drink its nectar and eat its pollen or fruit. Um, Professor Ran 
Randolph Menzel, an insect neurobiologist at the Free University in Berlin, conducted tests that show bees that eat syrup contaminated with pesticides are unable to use their memory of landmarks in the surroundings uh, to find their way back to the hives, flying in random circles rather than straight lines. And there was a study um, that I read up on as well about neonicotinoids. Um, and this field of researchers in the UK subjected um, a colony of honeybees to this, to this pesticide. They then attached little antennas to their heads and then watched their flight patterns after that. And it was tiny little quantities of this pesticide and then observed their behavior. And they flew in completely erratic patterns, just like zigzags. They couldn't, they couldn't figure out where they were. And usually bees, when they want to find their home, they fly in circles, concentric, concentric circles. And it's a very common pattern with bees. But after being subjected to this pesticide, they couldn't do that. Uh, and in many cases, the bee just landed somewhere and died. So yeah, it's really, really dangerous. Um, it was banned, actually, in the UK not so long ago, but apparently it's just been brought back to the shelves, which is a tragedy. Um, yeah. um, another thing that's plaguing our bees is the Varroa mite, as you can see here attached to one of the little lava bees, and then also on our lovely queen bee on the back there. Um, the Varroa mite uh, is the destroyer, that's what the name means. Um, it's a significant cause of honeybee um, decline is the varroa mite. Uh, it's the mi microscopic creature um, which originated in Asian bee populations but then spread to the, to the west following experiments to increase honey yields in Asian bees. So basically the import and distribution of foreign bees is having a really terrible effect on our bee population. We're spreading diseases that are rife in other countries and bringing them here to our country and it's just spreading. The bees have no defense for that really. Um, and it's really sad to see the varroa mites actually because um, it can be quite hopeless if, if the varroa mite grows stronger and stronger. It's quite hard to treat. Um, but there are some natural options out there actually, um, like homeopathy. Um, tea tree oil is really effective at reducing varroa count. Um, and there's certain uh, instructions of how to do that, certain quantities, which if anyone's a beekeeper, I'd be happy to share um, at a later date. Um, yeah. So yeah, that was the dark side. Um, that's basically what's happened to our bees and what's happened to our landscapes and what's happening to us through that process. Um, but there is a path of healing um, and that's through regeneration in many, many different forms. Um, one of them is the re re uh, regeneration of community, um, which is huge and it can have a profound effect to heal the planet. Um, there's a really, there's a huge rise in organic, in the organic farming community. Um, community farms, uh, community orchards, people getting together and growing their own food um, is a huge step that we can take to ensure abundance for our futures. As we could see earlier with the monocrops, we have a dependency on them at the moment, you know, to provide things for us. We go to Tesco and they give us our food, you know, but we have a right, it's, it's our birthright really to step back into that process, you know, and it's amazing healing experience to grow your own food. It's really profound to eat a, str a strawberry or a tomato that you've grown yourself. I'm sure many of you know that. Um, so yeah, it's, I think it's something that we can all do is basically even just grow just a little bit, you know, and become... Um, regain our autonomy with our food source. Um, so yeah, essentially, um, so as the bees, we can learn a lesson from the bees in this respect, I think. So as we said earlier, um, the bees are working every day to sustain themselves primarily um, through gathering nectar and pollinating plants. Uh, but through those actions, they're essentially a sustaining um, a world of abundance for the rest of us. And so if we take that lesson from the bees and start to think about ourselves and heal ourselves first and foremost by regenerating our landscapes and growing our, food, our own food and feeding ourselves the medicine that we need, in essence, that's going to have a much wider effect. It's going to have a rippling effect that's going to add to the diversity of life. Um, it's going to feed a plethora of birds and bees and bugs and hedgehogs and foxes and everything, you know, it's going to feed the soil, it's going to have a knock-on effect. So even just doing a small part, growing strawberries or blackberries, it has a huge effect. Um, so yeah, I think that's something that we can all do to, to help the bee population. It's um, essentially aligning ourselves with the purpose of the bee. Um, another thing we can do is create safe space for bees, you know, because bees need somewhere to live. Um, it's all well and good for them to have loads of food, but they need somewhere to take that home to. They need, they need a hive, you know? 
And so just creating safe spaces in your gardens. I mean, this is a beautiful image here of something that somebody's created. Uh, it's like a bug hotel or something. Like, it's, it looks wonderful. It looks like it's just out of pallets. I think it's pallets and then, like, sticks and logs and stones and all different types of habitats available for whoever wants to move in there. It looks really cool, actually. I'd like to do that. Um, but also just setting aside wild spaces in your garden that you don't, like, uh, that you don't dig up, you just essentially leave them there. Because, you know, bees generally, it's, you know, it's nice to make these, but I think bees just like to find their own spot too. So they'll nest in walls or under your shed. Or I found a, um, a bumblebee hive the other day. It was really cool. Um, inside like cylinder blocks. Is that what they're called? Freeze blocks. Freeze blocks. Yeah, inside those, um, I lifted it up and I could hear this huge hum coming from there. So there's probably about 200 bees in that hive, and I was like, cool. It's nice to know that that's there, you know? Um, so yeah, just, just setting aside space for bees, you know? And planting flowers close to those spaces, you know? Because the bees really need food very, very close to the hive, you know? Especially in early spring. I'll go into it in a minute with the, the queen bees, but it's really essential for them to have an abundance of food near the nest. Um, yeah. I, I will recommend some plants as well um, that are really nectar-rich uh, plants for bees. I actually have some seeds too um, of borage, which is my favourite bee plant, and the bees love it. It's bee bread. Yeah, this is this is borage. Um, it's a fantastic plant. I love it. Um, I planted so much of it this year, um, and my plants are massive now. They're like up here, and I have to like stake them down. And all day, every day, there's just bees all over it. You know, the amazing thing about borage is it refills its nectar stores within two minutes. So a bee, a hungry bee, can feed on one of the flowers and then fly to another flower and then another flower and then return to that same flower that they started with and it'll be full of nectar again. So it's an abundant resource. Mm -hmm. So keep flowering for at least a month as well. Yeah, it keeps going, yeah. And, and it actually flowers right up into the autumn, which is this valuable resource for the bees just before they go into hibernation. And I think it can survive some frost as well. So if the bees are really, really hungry, then they will venture out. Um, they will venture out to get it. Um, it's really easy to grow. It's a weed, you know. Uh, it's a bit spiky, so sometimes gardeners don't like it, but I think it's really, really beautiful. And if we could just plant some for the bees, you know, that's, that's enough, you know, we just work around it. Um, and here's another list of some beneficial bee plants. Some of them I can't pronounce. Um, but th at the top, there's blackberries and hawthorn and like stone fruits. Um, and then there's clovers and gorse uh, and mimosa. And then there's all the herbs, you know, that feed us as well. Um, rosemary and lavender, sage, uh, salvias, thyme, mint, uh, bee balm, which is lemon balm, which is also called Melissa, which has that tie to the bee goddess thing that I'm looking into, um, and cat mint. And then all your brassicas and your dandelions are really good for bees. So sometimes gardeners don't like them. I think they're really, really pretty, actually. It's just this shift of focus, you know, rather than seeing it as a weed, to see it as an abundant resource for, uh, for bees, you know, and, and it can be quite beautiful if, if it's in the right place. <laughs> um, so yeah, and heather as well. Heather's a really, really good one because it's really rich in pollen, which is really good protein for the bees. So yeah, heather, I would recommend planting heather as well. Echinacea, that must make good Echinacea. honey. Echinacea, yeah. it'd be really medicinal honey as well, actually. Yeah. yeah, good for the bees, good for the immune system, actually. That could be good. This is a plant um, that I hold in really high regard. I'm gonna plant some for next year. Uh, it's a pussy willow. And this is really, really good for queen bees, uh, queen bumblebees, just shortly after they emerge from the nest in early March. These bees are starving. They are so hungry. They've been in a long sleep and they are desperate for nectar. Like they are on their last legs when they emerge from the nest. And so they really need they really need nectar and they really need it fast. Um, and so if you plant a pussy willow, uh, the female uh, plant is the one that uh, secretes the nectar. And so if you have a pussy willow, it will be draped in bumble queen bumblebees, which are massive. You know, there'll just be a hum all over your tree, and that'll be a really good resource for those bees in those early days. Um, they're they're desperate for that nectar. And then shortly after that. And when the bees have fueled up and they've got energy, they'll look for the male pussy willow plant, which is full of pollen, um, which is really rich in protein, which the bees then need um, to expand their ovaries so that they can begin laying and start the nest. 
because um, they're all shriveled up, you know, because of the starvation process, and they need that that uh, protein to expand them. So plant both, um, but just be careful where you plant them as well, because they're really thirsty. Uh, they like a lot of water, uh, so yeah, plant your willows near water. Um, swales, eh? swales, yeah, dig some swales. Speak to Steve, I'll tell you all about it. Um, yeah, so the thing with bumblebees as well, um, they need to feed constantly to survive, you know, like there's all that, those stories about, oh, it's impossible that the bumblebee flies. It's not impossible, but it takes a huge amount of energy because they're so big, you know, and they have very fast metabolisms, like 75% faster than a hummingbird. So really, really fast. They need to feed constantly. Um, and so when a queen bee is in those early days, it's a really difficult time of her life. She has a lot of responsibility and she has to rear her young and start the nest. It's really important that she has nectar close by, you know, so that she can go off and feed and return to the brood before it cools down too much, you know. Um, a thing that people ask me all the time is like, is it okay to give bumblebees sugar water when you see them on the ground, you know? Um, and it depends, you know, like, especially in spring and if it's a queen bumblebee um, and she looks like she's on her last legs then yeah I would recommend that or some honey if you've got organic honey I know it's hard to judge but like like sourced from a good source you know like give them a little bit of honey just to get them back into the air because they use that energy really really fast like a bumblebee that has a, a belly full of uh, nectar is only 40 minutes away from starvation because it takes so much energy they feed constantly so sometimes they can run low on fuel so yeah, just give them a little bit of fuel if they need it. Um, so yeah, another thing we can do, sadly the images aren't there. This is Im There were some images of, of myself and Andrew and Ollie um, on our beekeeping apprenticeship with Jerry. Um, yeah, uh, basically anyone can be a beekeeper. It's really easy and really enjoyable and really life affirming and really healing to spend time with these majestic, magical, like reverent beings. Um, I think you just have to be a little bit patient um, and you have to be quite smooth and quite calm because essentially it's a meditation spending time with the bees and it should be entered as such in a state of reverence um, because we are communing with gods, goddesses in my opinion. Um, and so as you approach the hive, um, do so in a state of calm, relaxed uh, relaxation. And I really like to ask permission as well before I enter the hive, because you wouldn't just barge into someone's house and be like, I'm here, I'm just going to do what I'm going to do, I'm going to make a cup of tea. Um, you'd knock first and you'd, you know, you'd be welcomed inside, you know. So I like to undergo that process every time I see the bees. Um, and just spend time with them because it's a deeply healing experience. They emanate such a pure, beautiful, beautiful vibration. The buzz is their vibration and it's deeply healing to be in the presence of that. Um, so yeah, just sitting with the bees is nurturing all in itself. That's probably one of the biggest gifts actually that the bees can give us is their healing. Um, and bees, in my opinion, they're just waiting, you know, they're waiting to make this contact, you know. You can communicate with bees and they're, they're happy to share with you their secrets. You know, if you're patient enough to listen um, and you approach in the right manner of respect, I really believe that, you know. Uh, yeah, so we're going to watch a video by Gunther, who's one of my favourite beekeepers. He's really inspiring. The honeybee crisis at this time is worldwide. We are losing honeybees all over the world. In America, we are losing about 30 to 32 percent each year. I'm afraid that the commercial beekeepers that truck hundreds, thousands of colonies, millions of colonies around the country for pollination services that this is going to be a, a dead end because that is definitely not sustainable. And of course, when you think that one step further, then our food supply is not sustainable. Pollination, of course, means that we have fruit and berries and broccoli. A lot of what we eat depends on this pollination. So here we have a crisis that actually is a blessing in disguise because a, a crisis wants to let us know that we have to change something. Should we 
do something for that being, not only ask what do I get out of that being, but what does this being actually need? And right now the honeybee needs our protection, our care. I would say everybody can be part of that. People can omit the pesticides and herbicides on their front and back lawns. They can plant annual flowers, perennial flowers in small plots, plots even on your balcony, even in a little pot. You can buy honey from bees that is more expensive, but where the bees are treated better. You can buy as much as possible organically certified vegetables because these organic farmers are not allowed to use all these pesticides and herbicides. And one can become a beekeeper. It's not that hard to become a beekeeper. I can assure you, once you start, you're probably hooked for life. It's very addictive to become a beekeeper because that loving relationship that we have with that insect is very important. And so now is the time to say, okay, for the last hundred years we've asked what makes the honeybee profitable, as an advertisement said, and now is the question, what do you need? It's an absolute necessity now to look at what we are doing in nature, how we treat the animals, and I mean all the domestic animals how we treat the cows and the pigs and the chickens and the goats and all of them are suffering because of how we keep them, how we treat them. These beings will give us what we need if we give them what they need. We have the choice to either learn and change in freedom or we are going to be forced to change. And you all know that to change without being forced is a lot more fun. Yeah, I really love that video. I think he just puts it all in a nutshell. Um, the problems that we're facing um, and what we can do to essentially step back into that beloved partnership with bees and with nature. Um, there's more stuff about uh, with Gunther on the internet. Um, if you're interested in him, just do look him, look him up because he's really inspiring. Um, I particularly like um, when he said that the bees will give us what we need as long as we recognize uh, that we need to give them what they need. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's about reciprocity and an interchange of love and kindness, you know. Um, and I think we should regain that, um, that process. Um, so I wanted to speak a little bit about the hives, the different hives that are out there. If anyone is interested in becoming a beekeeper, as Gunther said, it is really, really easy and deeply, deeply enriching. Um, and I do recommend it. This is the top bar hive that I was talking about earlier, the Toblerone hive uh, that I first witnessed on the seed preservation farm. Um, this is a wonderful hive, actually, because anyone can make it. Um, one of the reasons why people don't get into beekeeping immediately is because to buy a hive is actually really quite expensive. I mean, you can get them secondhand if you're lucky enough, but to buy one, um, you're looking at like a hundred plus pounds, you know, for like a cedar hive. So it's quite expensive. But with these hives, you can build yourself. It's really easy. I have Gus, he's my on hand uh, carpenter. He does that kind of stuff. Oh, I want Gus. Yeah. Everyone needs a Gus. Everyone needs a Gus. Um, it's really simple. Uh, the plans are on the internet. Um, super, super simple. We, we built two um, together in our uh, beekeeping apprenticeship in like one day. So it's really quick as well. Um, and it's quite cheap. You can use reclaimed wood that's not treated with any chemicals. You want to keep it organic. Um, and yeah, you can throw it up in a couple of days. Hopefully, uh, Gus is going to do mine soon. <laughs> um, so the beautiful thing about this hive, as well as being cheap and affordable and easy to build, um, it's concerned with bee welfare, first and foremost. So it's a bee-centric design. So it's basically uh, mirrored around the idea of a hollow log. I know it doesn't look like a log, but it's supposed to kind of be like a hollow log turned on its side. Um, and it's a hollow chamber inside into which the bees then build their combs. Um, yeah, all you do basically is you provide the bees with 
bars, uh, like thin bars, uh, cut to specific dimension. Um, and then you drizzle a tiny little bit of wax down the center so that the bees then know where to build the comb. And then they, and then they do what bees do, they build comb and they build it in such beautiful, it's got, you would love it. It's the sacred geometry encapsulated in that. When you hold it up to the sun, it brings a tear to the eye. It's really beautiful. Um, and so they build it down in long U shapes. Um, and uh, yeah, building, like, building wax for bees is part of their natural process. You know, it's, it's what they do and it's really good for them to exercise those wax making glands. Um, it keeps them healthy, it keeps them strong. Um, and it's basically putting the power back into the, the hands of bees if they have hands. Um, because then they, they have a choice, you know, they have a choice of how to build their own home and how to live. Um, they get to choose where they lay their brood, they get to choose where they store their honey, um, and it's orientated around their own design. So in nature, I have some comb somewhere. Um, maybe it's in my pocket, maybe I could pass it around. I think it's in my pocket. Um, in nature, bees never build anything in uniform, you know? Like you look at one comb and there's a variety of different cell sizes just on that one comb alone. Um, because they know what they need, you know? Like they don't want a uniform comb. And um, I'll go into the National Hive in a second, but um, basically giving bees a foundation sheet where all the cells are the same size can be quite detrimental, actually. Uh, it's, it's, it's basically breeding weaker bees. Um, so yeah, I really, really like this hive. Um, it's the hive that we trained on, that we learned beekeeping, and it's associated with this new movement in beekeeping, well, relatively new, um, like the balanced beekeeping world, basically. Um, taking care of the needs of the bee first and foremost before we consider our desire for honey. It's ensuring that they have everything that they need before we choose to harvest honey from them. Um, the thing with this hive, I, when I arrived in the UK in December, I was ready to go. I was like, I want to build these hives for everybody. Let's go. Top bars are amazing. They're the future. But then I realized that, you know, I'm relatively new to the beekeeping world in the UK. I've only been here since December. And so I'm unfamiliar with the nectar flow cycles and seasons and how much food there is for the bees. And I realized the amount of resources that it takes to build a wax comb and then to harvest that wax comb. Because when you harvest honey from this, it's beautiful, actually. You just pick up the bar and slice off the whole comb and put it into a bucket um, and then put the, bucket, like, the lid on really quickly um, and then you get to press out the honey and then you use the wax for making candles and other things. Um, you get, I think it's with these hives, if you are in it for honey production in a sustainable, um, in a sustainable way, asking permission from the bees, of course, beforehand, um, you actually get more wax. I think it's like six times more wax, uh, but it's like 20% less honey. So. It's not really a hive that's associated with honey production. It's more about bee welfare and just allowing them to live in a state that resembles their natural state, um, allowing them to do what bees do. Um, yeah, I really love this hive. I'm um, looking forward to having my top bar in the UK. Um, also, an interesting point with this, it, re it facilitates a clear communication throughout the hive. So everyone kind of knows that when bees when bees communicate w with one another they do the the infinity dance you know like figure eight symbols um as a means of basically displaying where the honey is uh, and the nectar flow um and when they do this dance they they vibrate the comb of the hive because if you imagine inside the hive the bees can't see because it's really dark they don't actually see the dance they feel the vibration of the dance and that vibration is then passed all along the hive from one comb to the next comb to the next comb. And so every bee in that hive feels that vibration as it sends the message along. Um, when the bees are made completely from wax, that facilitates that process really well because the, the comb vibrates um, really, really well. But as you'll see with the national hive, they tend to have uh, wire strips running through it. Um, and that kind of breaks the, the chain of communication somewhat. And you'll notice, you, you may have noticed in the hives, sometimes if you have a national hive with wire, sometimes the bees will kind of like bite out little bits of the comb to try and aid that process, to try and attune it to the right frequency so that they can pass the messages along. So they're really trying to kind of aid that process of communication. And when bees can't communicate, it kind of creates a bit of a discord, you know? It's another step away from nature. It's making it a bit more difficult for them to go about their business. Um, so that was the top bar. This is the national hive, which is generally like the hive that most people here in the UK use. Um, it's the most common hive. Um, it's been around for ages and ages. I think it's actually, um, the development of this came from an American hive, which is the Langstroth hive, um, developed by Reverend Langstroth. 
Um, and he was a reverend, so he was, you know, a, a Christian man. And so you can imagine a Christian, a reverend, um, they're of the opinion, I can imagine, that um, God's creations are there to serve man, you know, like he's at the top of the food chain and he can use resources as he wishes. And so I, I assume that's why he built the hive in this way, because it's human centric and it's to do with honey production and resources and how they can use them. Although he did have a really loving relationship with his bees, it was um, more focused around the human need. Um, so yeah, it's used for honey production just because it takes a lot less resources for the bees to actually fill those combs with nectar. So if they don't have to build the combs themselves, they can just spend all the time foraging and bringing in honey. So they get a much, much larger yield of honey with this design. But again, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's assuming that we know how the bees want to live. It's giving them frames to build, um, to build their homes upon um, that they wouldn't necessarily make for themselves you know it's it's to suit us rather than them um, in these foundation sheets they call them and um, the cells are actually really big as well um, if you notice um, with the top bar hive the cells are a lot smaller especially in the brood chambers um, because bees like to be born in smaller cells um, but in this in this design the cells are really big uh, so it's focused on honey again so they can get more honey into the hive and fill them up um, and there's research to suggest that bees that are born from these bigger cells are actually weaker and less resistant to the varroa mite because the mites can climb on inside there. There's loads of room for them to, to move around and to breed. Um, and there is research out there to suggest that when the bees can build their own comb, they will adapt the comb um, if there's a rising problem of varroa. So they'll make the cells a lot smaller so that the varroa can't live there, can't breed. So essentially, they'll start to take care of the problem themselves, you know, because they know what they're doing, you know, we just need to give them the power back. Um, I think the, the original thought was that a bigger cell would produce a bigger, stronger bee, but it's not necessarily yeah, true. Yeah, mm. I think that was it. Yeah, they were like, big bees, surely they're going to be much stronger, but I think it's had the adverse effect. But there are adaptations, right, that, that you can make to this hive to make it more natural yeah, and so that they are... I'm sorry. going on to that. Sorry. Yeah, um, <laughs> uh, there is a positive aspect, actually. Um, so this, it requires less resources to run this hive. And so if you are choosing to enter into that partnership where be, with bees, whereby it's reciprocal, and um, you give them what they need, and you choose to, you ask if you can share part of the nectar, um, you can actually return the wax back to the hive. Because it's a, it's a really valuable resource for bees, and it takes a lot of labor um, for them to produce that wax. So the benefit, you can return that wax back and save them from all of that labor. Um, which is why, um, as Ollie was saying, um, there is a fusion um, that a few beekeepers out there are doing and it's, it's something that I'm starting to do myself um, with my bees. It's a fusion between a top bar and a national. Uh, yeah, I think it's on the next slide. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so this is the idea of the fusion. Um, this is a picture of me uh, capturing my first, first ever UK swarm. Uh, it was about a month ago, maybe just a bit more than a month ago, um, and it was up at the community farm in Garth, which is not that far away, and this farm is a beautiful, beautiful place run by Jude, who is a loving, beautiful soul, and she's created a habitat of complete abundance. She's a wonderful woman, um, and if you'd like to see a farm in operation that sustains life, do check out Jude, she's awesome. Um, so yeah, this is me capturing the swarm, and it was really cool how it happened, actually, because um, I made contact with Jude ages ago in the winter um, through email and through phone calls, you know, and kind of said, hey, I'm a beekeeper, you know, it'd be nice to kind of spend time with you and share stories and see what we can do together. But I never made it up there for months and months and months just because, like, life and I was busy doing my own thing and I didn't manage to get up there. And then one day I got a phone call um, and Jude was like, Stephanie, it would be cool if you came today. Like, I'm really looking forward to meeting you. I'd like to have a bee talk, you know, we can talk about top bars, you know, we can exchange knowledge and just share space with the bee. So I was like, okay, okay, today's the day, like, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go. So I got myself up there, the car broke down, loads of stuff happened, but I managed to get up there, um, and I entered into the farm with Jude, and then we heard this, like, buzzing in one of the bushes, and she was like, that's strange, you know, there shouldn't be bees there. And we turned around, and there was this huge swarm, like, massive. It was a primary swarm, they call it. It's like most of the bees kind of absconded the hive, and 
and left a swarm and so we kind of looked at each other and we're like let's get it you know let's it, was a, it. it was only moments before they were talking about capturing a swarm yeah yeah it was really cool it was really synchronistic actually um, and capturing a swarm it was really easy like way easier than it sounds um, this was my first time doing it, so I used Jude's method, which I would definitely use again in the future, and I recommend it. It was really easy. You get a skep hive, or you could use a plant pot, or whatever you have. I'm sure you're familiar with collecting swarms as well. Um, but basically, you lay out the, the sheet, and then put the, the skep hive on top of it, just uh, propped up with a stick or a rock or something. And then this particular hive was in a little bush, like a really thorny bush. Um, so I got some snippers. Um, what's the name of those snippers? Secateurs, <laughs> got some secateurs, um, and I snipped the hive out of the bush, um, and then just delicately placed it inside the inside the skep, and I scooped up a few bees really, really gently, and just kind of urged them inside. But I didn't get all the bees, you know, it's really hard to get all of them. But as long as you get the queen, the rest of the bees will follow because of the hormone, the pheromone that she secretes. And so we walked away and left them to it, and came back an hour later, and all the bees were inside. Um, so we removed the stick and then just wrapped it up in the sheet and tied a string around it and then you've got your bees. Mm -hmm. Ma most of the time that works like magic. Yeah. And, um, but I had one once where um, I went to a house and there was a uh, small bees in a dustbin which had a load of rubbish in there. Yeah, I've heard that. Yeah. Oh, crikey, I'm not going to get them out here. Uh, but when the bees are in the swarm, they don't sting. They, they yeah, they're out. really gentle. So, uh, you know, do it with gloves. I can, I've done it without gloves but in this case, put gloves on and just scoop them out into a bucket or something and then put them on the sheet. And uh, they're all, when the queen's in the hive, you know the queen's in the hive because they all go marching up the sheet into the hive, like little soldiers. <laughs> and um, at this time, they were, they were going up and they were coming down. They were going up and they didn't seem like that they knew where to go. Oh, hmm, something wrong here somewhere. So I went back over there and there was the queen, all on her own, sitting on the top of this dustbin lid. Picked up the queen, put her in the hive, and all went back. Oh, 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 that's <laughs> awesome. Well spotted. Because <laughs> you spotted her. My friend Avian was bringing a hive back from South Wales, and they escaped inside the car. Oh, really? I mean, yeah, obviously, he drove, he drove, we drove over an hour with like a swarm sweeping down the windscreen like this. Wow. We're moving very slowly. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so oh my gosh, that would be so intense. <laughs> wow. That would be super intense. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. But as you're explaining, in that state, the bees are really, really docile. Um, they're not very likely to sting you, actually, because they don't really have anything to defend. I mean, they have themselves, but they don't have the hive. And so it's very rare that you'll get stung uh, capturing a swarm. And as you yeah, said, you can do it by hand. The hive is full of brood. They're more likely to be more aggressive then than when there's not so many brood in. That's it, yeah, because they've got all the babies to protect, which is the regeneration of the hive, you know, it's the next generation. Um, and as you said, you can do it barehanded. Um, there's a wonderful woman that lives in Oregon called Laura B. Um, she taught me a lot about sacred partnership with bees. Um, she works with the College of the Melissa and she does all of her beekeeping without a veil, without a uniform, without gloves, everything. Even when she's harvesting honey, you know, like she has that partnership with the bees, it's amazing. That's why you see these pictures of people with bee beards. Exactly. You know, because bees are in swarm and they're not yeah, exactly. They just swarm onto the bit. They get the queen and they swarm around her. Um, so yeah, she just does it with bare hands every time. It's really cool. I hope she's going to come to the UK. I think she is sometime. Um, so yeah, capturing swarms, it's a really good way to source local bees as well. So we were talking earlier about the spread of disease through the Varroa mite. Um, that's because of importing foreign bees, stealing local bees' jobs. Um, so yeah, <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. It's <laughs> <laughs> foreign bees stealing our Still bees jobs. jobs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a joke. Um, so yeah, it's a good way to source local bees because local bees are much more suited to the t to the terrain here, to the nectar flow. They're much stronger in this environment. So if you can get local bees, that's the best. Um, just manifest a swarm, just put it out there. Uh, that's what I did. I, uh, yeah, I said I wanted a swarm and it appeared. Um, so yeah, someone else has a story about that too. Um, so yeah, also, um, if you if you are looking for bees and, and you don't manifest that swarm, uh, just go and see a local beekeeper. Um, and often if you develop a partnership and a, and a friendship with them, they're happy to share bees with you actually. Because uh, a lot of the time, 
beekeepers might not want to expand like huge huge amounts so they might be happy to share. When I first started beekeeping, um, I haven't done it now, I gave it up eight years ago so I didn't do it anymore, but when I first started someone said a good way to get bees is to get some old comb, put it in a hive, set it up and, um, and the, the, the local bees in the area will be able to detect the, the, the smell of the, totally. the, the, um, the wax uh, uh, and, and the queen essence and so on and, and they'll find it and if there's a swarm in the area, they'll just go into it. Exactly. No, I'll think so, yeah. What's the likelihood of that? Well, it's probably about nothing, you know. <laughs> so I thought, well, I'll do it anyway to see what happens. I left it there, went back a few days later, nothing at all, but yeah, a load of rubbish. Went back another time, and when I went back, there was loads of bees flying around, but none inside the hive. Oh, hmm. Seemed to be taking an interest. So I went away, come back the next day, the whole hive was the bees. Wow, that's so yeah. cool. What a beautiful way to source bees. Yeah. It's, I mean, they choose the hive then freely of their own accord, you know. You're just providing them what they need, the, the valuable resources, wax and, and shelter, you know. It's a gorgeous way to do it. I've also heard that um, if you plant lemon, no, lemongrass. lemongrass, yeah, that's it, around the hive, it actually smells like the pheromone that the queen secretes. And so when a bee, when a hive is swarming, um, there'll be some kind of like uh, scout bees, I guess, that kind of go off um, and leave the swarm and go and investigate different areas. And if, if they smell the lemon balm, they might be attracted to that area. Or in, your, in that case, uh, the bees smell the wax and they, yeah. they move on in there. So, or yeah. Or essential oil as well. That's, that's, essential oil. that's a good point. And drizzle it, yeah. Maybe, maybe mix with a little bit of water. I can imagine it could be really strong. <laughs> but you might want it strong. Um, okay. Um, so this other picture here, uh, there's a picture of me sat in the garden uh, building some frames for the national hive that I have. Um, so I'm basically, I want to do a project this year and as I said, I'm, you know, I'm new to British beekeeping and so I'm unfamiliar with the, with the nectar flow cycles and seasons and the abundance of food that's available for bees. Um, so rather than build a top bar first off, I decided to do this fusion hive. Um, have I mentioned the fusion hive? Yeah. Yeah, I'm getting onto it. Um, so yeah, I decided to do this fusion hive, whereby I introduced the bees into a national hive, which is commonly associated with honey production. However, there's a difference. I'm, I, I'm choosing to let the bees build their own comb within the hive. Um, so in this picture, you can see they, the bees have their own frames, um, but I'm just giving them a small starter strip, just to show them where it would be preferable uh, for me, for them to build their wax combs. Um, Otherwise, it's really hard to inspect and kind of maintain uh, the health of the hive if you can't remove the panels. So, I mean, that's the intervention of the beekeeper. And I think that's justified in order to enter into that beloved partnership. Um, so, so in this fusion, I'm allowing the bees to build their own comb uh, by their own design um, and basically regain overall autonomy over how they live um, and, and how, they, how they rear their young, where they choose to lay their brood. Um, and it comes with all the benefits, as I mentioned earlier, of bees building their own comb. Um, the reason why I wanted to do this as well um, is so that I can essentially, if I, if I do harvest some honey from the hive, I can return the comb. Um, back to the bees but also I think undergoing a project like this it could be a really nice bridge um, to already existing beekeepers that are familiar with the National Hive but are looking to step into a more sustainable way a more balanced method of beekeeping whereby they can basically give back the power to the bees and, and focus on bee centric beekeeping rather than human centric necessarily and so I think this could be a really nice bridge um, for people to move into a more sustainable way and so before I preach about that I think it's only right that I, I go through my own process um, and observe the effects uh, and observe the bee welfare um, and how they how productive they are and how healthy they are and yeah so it's a bit of an experiment um, but that's what I'm doing these days. Um, so yeah, just to end really, um, it's a little bit about the projects uh, that I'm involved in these days. Uh, it's called Aini Beekeeping. Um, I chose Aini um, as the name for this beekeeping enterprise. Um, it's, it's, a it's a word that I brought back from South America. Um, it's a word that the indigenous people use there, um, which means reciprocity, but it's a much deeper
deeper understanding of that process. It's the interchange of loving kindness, of knowledge and the fruits of one's labor between individuals and the environment. So the way that the people live out there, um, they realize that nothing goes one way. Everything is an interchange in all of its forms, in human interaction um, and with interaction in, with the natural world and with all of Mother Nature's um, beings, also with the spirit world. And so before any kind of harvest is taken, whether it's corn or quinoa or whatever they choose to harvest, they always do an offering first and give thanks first and foremost for the abundance that they're about to receive because they realize that that is a gift. It's not something that they're entitled to, it's a gift from nature herself. And so it's a partnership, you know, it's an, in recognition of that gift they give offering. And so I chose Aini as the term for my beekeeping enterprise because I believe that's kind of what we need to step into now, you know? The bees have been sustaining us for, for like thousands, millions, whatever years, you know, they've been sustaining life on Earth, um, doing their job for us, you know, and for all of creation. Um, and I really feel that it's time now that we, that we recognize that, you know, and see what we can give as interchange for that, you know, like helping the bees today in the hopes that they can continue to help us tomorrow, you know, that's the whole thing with Aini, it's kind of like pass it on, you know, like I'll help you today and hopefully you'll help someone else another day, you know, it's, it's the gift that keeps on giving. Um, so really the project is to rekindle an understanding and appreciation of our sacred symbiotic connection with bees and plants prompting a revival of respect and reverence for these majestic beings. Working with individuals who share a passion for pollinators and who wish to do their part in ensuring a richer, more diverse future for themselves and for all their relations. Um, it's essentially building bee-centric hives in abundant spaces, planting flowers that bees love, uh, creating rich habitat uh, and abundance for them so that they can continue to ensure abundance for us. Um, so yeah, really the purpose of this is the maintenance of all life. You know, it's not just for us and it's not just for the bees, but it's for every being um, on this earth. Uh, and so yeah, this is the project that I'm currently beginning to do, you know, starting with myself and my own partnership with bees, um, undergoing this process of um, gaining that contact and that trust and that respect, and then hopefully in the future, passing that on um, and hopefully helping to train other people to rekindle that sacred re relationship with bees. Um, so yeah, I think there's one more slide, just to the Queen of the Sun. Um, this is a really, really good documentary. Um, all of the issues that I spoke about today um, uh, are, are beautifully explained in this documentary, Queen of the Sun, uh, What the Bee's Telling Us. It's a really, really beautiful documentary. And Gunther, the guy from earlier, um, he's on that documentary, so you get to hear more of him. And you'll meet eccentric characters like this dude um, down in the bottom right who's just like topless and he loves his bees like he strokes them with his mustache and he's like they love it um, it's really sweet like there's some eccentric beekeepers out there and it's nice to see them Can you, is that on youtube yeah it's on youtube yeah yeah do give it a watch it's a really insightful documentary um some of the resources that i found really useful uh the barefoot beekeeper um, he has a blog, he's online, um, I like to follow him and read his articles, um, some really good insights about bees and how we can better adapt our behaviours with bees uh, to suit them so that we can all live in abundance. Um, a book, uh, if you're interested in getting into Top Bar Beekeeping, this is like a bible for that, uh, Les Crowder, um, Top Bar Beekeeping, Organic Practices for Honey Bee Health. It's really, really good, it goes through everything you need to know. Once you've got like a grounding in knowledge, like if you do an introductory course or an ap apprenticeship, this book will basically tell you everything you need to know about Top Bar Beekeeping, it's really good. Um, and then this is a new book that I'm just starting to read and it's beautiful. Um, it's called The Song of Increase, Returning to Our Sacred Partnership with Honeybees. And that's by Jacqueline Freeman, um, who is essentially like a bee channel. You know, she's been working with bees um, and they're giving her messages and she's sharing them with mankind uh, from, from the mouth of the bee. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in that side of it, do check her out because she's really beautiful. Um, so yeah, I think that's it. Um, if there's any questions or anything or comments. At a free energy event, they said that bees don't fly, they said that they vibrate in the thorax and so they levitate. Whoa. I know. Whoa. And it kind of fits in with the whole, you know, consciousness of the bee. I just wondered whether you, you, you heard of that? I've never heard that, but I mean, it, it makes it makes sense to me. Yeah, yeah. Like the power of the hive, just being in the presence of this glorious vibration, it's potent, you know? And um, like, 
as I said earlier, it's a meditation. Um, but if you do your process of meditation first and maybe stretch a little, um, and then just spend some time sat with the bees before you enter their space, just observing them and watching them and seeing the pollen that they're bringing back and attuning yourself with the plants that are out there and in and their world, and then approach the hive, you know, gently and smoothly. And then I urge you just to kind of put your hands around the hive, like when you're in this state of meditation and feel the vibration coming off it because it's profound and it's really, really strong. It is, it's super pure um, and really, really powerful. And so it's, it's a real honor to be able to do that um, and to be welcomed into that sacred space. Um, it's really something really magical. When you open up the hive, you can smell all that lovely honey. Mm. It's gorgeous. Yeah. It's gorgeous. You're in bliss the whole time that you're that you're in the hive. It's gorgeous. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful aromas, beautiful smells, beautiful sensations. Like something I didn't really mention earlier um, is like the whole thing of the uniform. So. Um, Generally, beekeepers, they tend to wear these big spacesuits, you know, and they're like, I'm going to the bees. And uh, they have all of this protection around them, like the bees can't get in, I'm safe, you know. But there's a really interesting thing that happens when you start to remove that uniform. Um, and Jerry, our teacher, he urged us quite early on in our beekeeping days just to take a glove off and see how that feels, you know. So we started with one glove and uh, the bees started crawling on our hands, you know. And at first you're like, oh my god, it's on my hand. And, um, and then pretty, pretty soon you realize that there's nothing to be afraid of. Like, they're not going to sting you. And as long as you're emanating that state of peace and loving kindness, you know, they emanate the same in return, you know. So actually having them crawling on your hands is a really nice sensation, you know. There's, there's nothing to be afraid of in that respect. And so after removing one glove, you take off two. And then after that, you take off the spacesuit. And then you're like, oh, they could get in my pants, they could get in my top, and sometimes they do. Um, but generally, the bees just want out as much as you do. So if you're really calm and really smooth, you can just kind of like open up your clothes and they'll fly straight out. There was an instance when I had like three bees inside my veil, because I'm a bit lackadaisical. I'm like, yeah, let's throw my veil on, let's go. And uh, there was a massive gap. And uh, three bees crawled in there while I was inspecting the hive. And we were doing some intense stuff that day. We were like detaching combs and harvesting honey. So it was quite an intense vibration at the hive. Um, and I had like swarm around my head. And then I noticed them crawling on my face. And they were like crawling on my eyes and stuff. Um, and that was a real moment of surrender, you know? Like you really have to surrender that fear. Otherwise they pick up on that, you know? And they act accordingly. So I just breathed. Um, and just calmly moved away from the hive and uh, opened it up and the bees just flew straight out, you know, like as long as you're calm, like you're cool, you know, they're not, they're not going to sting you, they don't want to sting you. Don't panic, Mr. Mannery. Yeah, don't panic, <laughs> don't panic, that's the main thing. Should we give, I think we should give Steph a <laughs> remark. the word beautiful a lot there that was a beautiful talk beautiful and coherent but the passion is is, is as i said overwhelmed us or i think well um it's, it's the bees had bad news didn't they you know in the 70s the bees had a lot of bad press there was killer bees it was towers unexpected with the bad man that was perverted with the bees and you're starting to look at this sort of like different on a psychological level communicating with the bees telepathically and empathically empathetically and it ties back in with what Dr. Nick start, Dr. Rock, sorry, started the, the whole talks with yesterday. You know, the, the geodes geodesic patterns of light, you know, resonant through platonic solids, information becomes matter. You know, we start to conceptualize these theories and they sounded weird a long time, a few years ago. And, and now young people will fly around the world, learn lessons from strange, semi-naked South Africans, <laughs> and then come back and say, I'm gonna do this. So I'm honored. And if we can give you support, or you can give us more of your knowledge, see they want a peer review. Okay, can we should we just add Beautiful. that you can find Ioni Beekeeping on Facebook, Ioni Beekeeping, and also through the Roots Project. If you look, if you take on the Roots Project cards, you'll be able to find it. There'll be an extension there that will link to that. Yeah, what we've suggested, uh, Dig, you know, a prodigious, prodigious Dig, Dig is quite, um, you know, putting together all the films, and we're going to be putting links under all the films, and then also we'll do sort of a generic video of all the people that spoke, all the people that have contributed. As I said, they are connected stories, and 
at times and I think it was a beautiful talk. We can uh, question her more over the next few years because we're probably going <coughs> to have this talk again. You know, like as you improve, you become a sort of artisan. We celebrate your skill. You propagate it out to us. Totally, and he puts his bee eyes back. So yeah. let's say thanks once again because I think it was a beautiful talk. And they always turn up and say, I've never done a talk before. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it. <laughs> People like him feel terrible now because he's had to practice for 20 years <laughs> and not go off concept and start talking about when it should be. So you've done beautiful. And as I said, uh, thanks very much, everyone, for coming. That's sort of like the end of the talks. Dinner will be in a bit. And then there's a sort of longer fireside slash staying in here out the rain. So we can all commune and vibrate together. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. Oh, um, and I have some... Oh, um. Um, I have some borage seeds, the plant I was talking about earlier. Um, and so if anyone wants to plant a borage plant, just come see me. I'm happy to share. I think I have enough seeds for everybody. So, yeah, come see me.